Here we are at the Civil War. We've done plenty of planter bashing along the way, and we've certainly been critical of the Northern political class. For the most part, though, these new Republicans have turned out looking pretty good. Well, it's time to change that. Today, historian and research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research, Phil Magnus joins us once again to talk about Lincoln as colonizationist. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. Okay, Phil, can you start us off? Uh, just We're talking about Lincoln as a colonizationist today. Uh, and now just explain to us first what that term means and put it in some context of the 19th century for us. Right, right. So before the Civil War, uh, there was actually a very vibrant movement in the United States uh, that was connected in some ways to anti-slavery, uh, but it also had a little bit of baggage associated with it. Uh, and that was the idea that uh, uh, the freeing of the slaves, uh, which could be attained through political processes, often they followed um, a proposal to compensate slave owners to uh, uh, essentially manumit or free their slaves at the end of their lives. And the idea behind colonization was that uh, the next step of that process was to actually uh, remove the freed slaves and settle them elsewhere, uh, other parts of the world that they thought were uh, uh, more suited for the African-American race. Uh, so it's a, uh, uh, a concept that's kind of rooted in uh, racial pseudoscience in one respect, paternalism in another respect, but at the same time generally tends to be anti-slavery. Uh, and the oddity of the colonization movement is it's a, uh, a major player in the American political scene from about the 1820s through the Civil War era, uh, including uh, forming a national organization, the American Colonization Society. Uh, to give you an idea of how prominent this organization was, uh, James Madison, the former president of the United States, was also a uh, president of the Colonization Society. Uh, several prominent figures in American politics were uh, similarly members. Uh, so Henry Clay uh, is another uh, president of the Colonization Society, one of its uh, original founders. Abraham Lincoln joined the Colonization Society in the 1850s. Uh, so pretty much a who's who of the American political scene in the antebellum um, is associated with this movement. Now you said Lincoln joined in the 1850s. Do you, do you know exactly what year? Or uh, I believe, yeah. So uh, there's a little bit of um, uncertainty exactly when he links up. I know uh, for certain there is a subscription he fills out to the organization, and that's in 1855. Huh. And what the uh, what the Colonization Society used to do is they would send their agents traveling uh, to the West, and they'd go from town to town trying to find the local prominent citizens, uh, particularly politically um, engaged persons. And they'd link up with them and uh, and have them join as members of the Colonization Society, sometimes form a local or a state chapter. And in Springfield, Illinois, where uh, Lincoln is uh, is set up shop as an attorney, he's uh, also active in state politics uh, and is considered a, a prominent figure on the Illinois scene. He is uh, recruited over the course of several of these visits. Uh, they come through Springfield trying to set up a Colonization Society in uh, the state of Illinois. And between about 1852 and 1855, he has several interactions with these uh, colonization society agents. Um, and eventually we found at least one receipt where um, he has filled out and uh, filed the subscription with the organization. Now, it also perhaps should be noted uh, that Illinois may have been the most racist state in the North uh, in terms of its policies, like it did for bad black people from entering the state, for example, right? Um, right, right. <laughs> and especially the Midwest in that era, um, if you think of New England as the hotbed of, uh, of more radical abolitionism, the Midwest is kind of a hotbed of a more moderate tempered uh, brand of anti-slavery thought that very much embraces colonizationism. Uh, in some cases, they link this to black code. So it's uh, that they're anti-slavery in the sense that they see the institution is wrong. Uh, they want to get rid of it, but at the same time, uh, they don't want the former slaves moving into their state. Uh, they don't want uh, to be connected to the post-slavery 
uh, life that uh, necess uh, necessarily follows from the abolition of this institution. Uh, so in one sense, it's good on the anti-slavery side, but in the other sense, it opens up all sorts of uh, uh, very morally trying complications of what they're trying to do in a post-slavery society. And Lincoln himself uh, is, uh, he, he does not events uh, strong racial animosity personally. In fact, he grows quite uh, actively over the course of the Civil War. Uh, the records that we have of his relationships with African Americans are very congenial, very friendly, uh, even to the extent that he'll, he'll recognize their personhood uh, in ways that other people in that era didn't. But at the same time, he never quite makes that leap to the radical abolitionism that uh, some of his contemporaries events. Yeah, I'm hearing you sort of describe the the political situation, ideological situation in Illinois, uh, Lincoln's endorsement or you know joining up with the colonization movement round about 1855, shortly after the Whigs start to really disappear as a national right. force, and it makes me think, oh, this guy already, this guy, it, this what a it seems like such a calculated political move to offer those particular and you know kind of nasty constituents uh, a, a, an opportunity to get rid of all the black people that they they uh, are going to be freeing with you know his his free territorial policies right like you you don't have to worry about them we're not going to let slave owners crowd them into your neighborhoods up north um, we'll just <laughs> dispel them from the country entirely yeah, there, there's certainly uh, political opportunism in it, uh, but you know, I'll say also say some things in defense of Lincoln. Please, uh, the, the perspective he's coming from, uh, I have no doubt that he's genuinely an anti-slavery man. Uh, we can see this as early as uh, there's hints of it in some of his surviving works from the 1830s and early 1840s. Uh, he's just a different type of an anti-slavery man than you find in abolitionism. Uh, we, and historians, for, for various reasons, have kind of uh, lost sight of this component of the American political scene uh, from the, uh, uh, the mid to late uh, antebellum period. And really, to understand Lincoln, you have to understand his hero, and that hero is Henry Clay. Uh, so Henry Clay is the senator from Kentucky, uh, the champion of Whig philosophy, uh, champion of an integrated economic system that's built around tariffs and internal improvements uh, to prop up the nation as a whole. So he's kind of an economic nationalist in a sense. But one thing Clay recognizes, and this is kind of odd because Clay himself was a, uh, a Southerner and a slave owner, but one thing Clay recognized is that uh, slavery created all sorts of economic tensions with uh, the system of thought that he articulated. Uh, it's called the American system. So it's a, imagine like uh, uh, 1840s Donald Trump style tariffs in, in a sense. Uh, but uh, Clay is the uh, proponent of the system. He views uh, the propping up of industry in the Northeast is also likely to economically benefit the producers of the raw materials that happen to be plantation uh, slave owners. And he views this as uh, ethically problematic for uh, very good reasons because it expands slavery. Uh, it's something that uh, breathes economic life into slavery uh, at a time when uh, older theorists had thought that slavery would gradually dissipate and, uh, and fall away. So Clay is horrified by this. And one of the things he does is he comes up with uh, what's referred to in some of the literature as the, the Whig formula for uh, dealing with the slavery problem. The Whig formula that he starts articulating is that we pair gradual compensated emancipation with colonization abroad, and this is kind of a managed political way to wean the nation off of slavery. Uh, so he articulates this uh, several points across his career, joins the American Colonization Society as one of the many public fronts that pushes this view, uh, and Lincoln enters into politics as an old Henry Clay Whig. Uh, so we know there's one instance in the late 1840s, uh, uh, most likely 1847 or 1848, although there's no clear date, where Lincoln actually travels to Kentucky uh, to hear Henry Clay give a fiery uh, anti-slavery speech that's premised on colonizationism. Uh, so there's a, uh, a little bit of a hint that Lincoln is involved in this movement very early on. 
Uh, and then by the time that we start getting uh, surviving copies of Lincoln's speech, is uh, one of his earliest ones is a eulogy to Henry Clay after Clay dies. And he touts Clay as an anti-slavery man, but he also touts him as a colonizationist. So uh, what you see is Lincoln kind of inheriting that mantle of, Henry, of Henry Clay going into the Civil War as the most prominent uh, figure in the American political scene who touts this old Whig formula of a more moderate uh, style of, uh, of working toward emancipation, gradualist emancipation uh, in ways that it's kind of a third way in between uh, uh, the, the, the radical abolitionists of the Northeast and then uh, the slaveholders of the South, but it's anti-slavery in character, but just, just kind of an oddity that uh, is very idiosyncratic to that time in history. Yeah. And now, of course, we've we've covered a lot of these themes on the show to a great extent. Uh, you know, most of the loco focos that we've covered uh, were more on the abolition end than the anti-slavery end, at least uh, the the ones that we've featured on the show. But as voters, they tended to vote with the block that was anti-slavery, that was sort of tolerate slavery in the South and find ways to to compromise uh, with the institution somehow to limit its its power and influence. Um, and Clay and Lincoln both actually played heroes of sorts in our Mexican War episode. Right. You know, when when right. Clay was opposed to annexing more slave territory, and uh, so was Van Buren, and so was Lincoln. And uh, but then <laughs> by 1848, Lincoln's back to being an enemy, at least on the show. Because he refuses to support Van Buren and the Free Soil Party, and he, at least according to newspaper reports of a, a speech of his in Boston, he says thanks to all his loco focoism, uh, and you know these economic issues, uh, his hatred for Van Buren as a Democrat, all of this stuff is just too much for a, a good party man uh, like Lincoln to swallow. But then by the you know mid to late 1850s, he's in the position of sort of leading. Uh, arch moderate in the new Republican coalition. So mm -hmm. could you tell us about his politics and uh, especially his discussions of slavery leading up to his election as president? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Lincoln is first and foremost a Whig. Uh, he says several points, even as late as his presidency, he says, I was an old Henry Clay tariff Whig. Uh, that's how I made my mark into Illinois politics. And you can go back to scraps of his speeches in the 1830s, and he's articulating the Whig platform. Uh, he's involved in the Whig campaigns of Henry Clay when he runs for president against uh, James Polk in 1844. Uh, he's also a backer of Zachary Taylor in 1848. Uh, so he's pretty much kind of a, a continuous champion of the Whig party. He's deeply ingrained in, uh, in that political operation. So there's automatically a, a dividing line that would put them opposed to, uh, to the Democrats, opposed to locofocoism. Uh, they see them as competitors. But uh, what you see is with the collapse of the Whig party um, in the mid 1850s is a political realignment starts to take place where anti-slavery Northerners in the Democratic party start to link up with old Whigs, uh, Whigs that had, uh, for the most part, followed Clay on the issue as well. There's a, a, a fairly natural coalition that emerges in the sense that both are opposed to the expansion of slavery into the territories and uh, less discussed, but equally as prominent in the rhetoric, the expansion of slavery abroad. So uh, during that whole era, there's several attempts, mostly driven by Southerners, to acquire territory, say in the Caribbean, uh, Central America, moving southward where they, they, they view this as the, uh, uh, the location of where new, uh, new and future slave states are going to be added, just as the territories uh, moving westward are going to be adding new and future uh, free states. Uh, so this is part of the whole political calculation. But what it does is it creates an opportunity for anti-slavery Democrats and anti-slavery Whigs uh, to join together and form a new political party, and Lincoln emerges uh, very prominently uh, in his Senate bid in 1858 as a very articulate spokesman for this new type of a party, uh, for this new position. So uh, uh, he, he attains national prominence running against Stephen Douglas. Uh, you have the famous uh, set of debates. The transcripts are published all across the country, and they figure out, hey, this guy's very articulate. 
Uh, he's smooth and savvy in front of the voters. He does have a moral compass. He's anti-slavery. Uh, he fits all of the uh, different stipulations that we need in a party candidate. So going into the 1860 uh, uh, Republican convention, uh, Lincoln, he kind of emerges as an underdog. Everyone thought it was going to be William Seward, uh, the uh, senator and former governor of New York, to be the standard bearer, uh, who was probably the most prominent Republican at the time. Uh, but as always, their uh, favorite son in coalition politics that uh, had a portion of the party was opposed to Seward. Uh, so what, uh, what Lincoln does is he slips into the convention as the candidate who uh, who satisfies elements of just about every different part of the Republican coalition. And there's this famous uh, private letter that Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, writes on the eve of the convention. Uh, he says, you know, we can't win outright with an anti-slavery man. Uh, John C. Fremont proved that in 1856 in the first national Republican bid, uh, ran on a strict anti-slavery ticket and got beaten badly. But Greeley says we can win on a tariff man, an internal improvements man, a, uh, a banking man, lists all these different components of the Republican coalition who also happens to be anti-slavery. And they didn't quite realize who at the time was going to fill, fulfill that, uh, uh, that role. But uh, Lincoln kind of naturally fits into it because he's got the Whig antecedents on his economics. Uh, he's a Midwesterner. Uh, so he's, he's not associated with political radicalism as much as, uh, as some of the Northeastern Republicans were. Uh, he's viewed as having a foot in multiple coalitions, and he's anti-slavery, but he's a moderate form of anti-slavery. So he's the natural candidate, and that, uh, that basically propels him into the nomination and eventually into the presidency. And now you have an article coming up uh, to be published here soon uh, on – Lincoln's tariff strategy in Pennsylvania right, in right. 1860. Uh, so could you tell us briefly about that uh, as an essential component of him actually winning this election? Yeah, and so this fits really uh, neatly into uh, uh, Lincoln's position as a candidate that can satisfy all the different coalition blocks of the Republican Party. And what happened is in, uh, in late 1857, 1858, in response to a financial panic, so uh, uh, basically a recession that set on in, in 1857, uh, there's a rebirth to the old tariff movement uh, to uh, uh, to enact protective tariffs as kind of a uh, a recession relief uh, process. Now, a modern economist will tell you that that's crazy, that that's uh, uh, a recipe for economic suicide, but there were serious theorists at the time that thought tariffs could be the macroeconomic relief to an economic downturn. Uh, one of them is an economist from Pennsylvania by the name of Henry Charles Carey, uh, probably one of the most prominent protectionist economists in the world at the time. And uh, Carey advances a tariff solution to this, uh, this recession in 1857. Uh, what it does is it stirs the state of Pennsylvania into almost a frenzy to acquire protection for its uh, its burgeoning iron and steel industries. And Lincoln recognizes this early on, but he also knows that other parts of the Republican coalition are free trade. A lot of the uh, the Democrats and former loco focos that came over, uh, when he mentions by name, uh, I'm sure you're uh, uh, quite familiar with, and that is uh, William Cullen Bryant, uh, is a big figure in the Republican coalition. In, uh, in 1860, and, and there, there's actually a letter where he says, you know, if I go to the, uh, uh, send my men to the convention uh, on, a, on a tariff platform, I'll satisfy the Pennsylvanians, but I'll, I'll infuriate Bryant. So uh, Lincoln is in this position of how do I win an election that services all these different constituencies? He personally was a tariff man, but he knew there were anti-tariff men in the Republican Party. Uh, just as he knew all these different styles of anti-slavery existed in the Republican Party. So what he ends up doing is he sends out a team of surrogates to specifically target the state of Pennsylvania, which is the big swing state in the 1860 election. It's you have to win Pennsylvania or else there's no chance of the presidency because uh, they had basically written off the South for the Republican strategy. So it's the electoral stronghold that delivers the votes that would put Lincoln over the top. Uh, there's no way he can afford to lose this state. So what his surrogates do is they uh, barnstorm across the state and meet with local congressional leaders and uh, uh, other local politicians in the Republican Party 
and they start showing him uh, this pile of documents that was Lincoln's old tariff speeches from the 1840s uh, in the Illinois State Legislature and as a campaigner for Henry Clay. Uh, so these things have been kind of lost to memory, and Lincoln in some sense has the only copies. And it's kind of a wink nod. They show it to the local congressmen. And here's Lincoln's speech on the uh, on the tariff uh, from the 1840s. He's with you. Can you signal this to your voters? But we don't want this in the national press because then it offends the other states and uh, and they lose parts of their coalition. Uh, he actually successfully executes on this strategy. Pennsylvania has a a local campaign on tariff protectionism while the national campaign is being carried out on uh, mostly on the issue of slavery in the territories. And those two together are able to bring the, uh, the electoral coalition uh, to success in both areas. Lincoln carries Pennsylvania and that boosts him basically into the presidency. So that's Lincoln's early career. But what changed once he actually held office and opportunities for emancipation and colonization abounded? You'll have to wait for part two next week, but in the meantime, you could read Phil's book on the subject, Colonization After Emancipation, Lincoln and the Movement for Black Resettlement. Thanks for listening. Liberty Chronicles is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Liberty Chronicles, please subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.